Before we dive into this video, let's understand one very important fact. I will be quoting a lot of the mainstream media, uh, but let's understand that uh, that same media is meant to confuse the heck out of you. So why am I quoting it? Why am I using that for my analysis? One thing I noticed for alternative media and all the YouTube channels uh, interviewing each other, you would probably noticed that I've never interviewed anyone on my channel, nor have I been interviewed on any other channels, rightly so, because I'm not sure I can add any value by uh, doing such a thing. One major problem I have with alternative channels and YouTube channels that bring much value to the overall picture is that once they have a guest on their show, and they're interviewing someone, uh, they tend to agree absolutely and not question the other party. Not question anything that they may not uh, entirely agree with. Even the mainstream journalists will probably make it appear as if they're doing a proper, proper journalism, but in the process they will ask some of the questions that uh, may not be 100% welcome by the interviewee and will put them on the spot. I have not noticed that with the alternative channels. There needs to be more debate. The same way that you viewers post your comments and questions and research on all of my videos for and against what I'm saying, this is welcome. I don't want to be around people who just agree with me, whether it's on this channel or at my work, my day job or my day-to-day -day life. Every time somebody disagrees with you, you learn something or you consider it, discard it because you just don't believe in it, you've done your research, or again, you realize that you might have been wrong or didn't look at it the right way. In any case, you've learned something. With that long introduction, it's no secret, and I've mentioned it before, that I do follow Digital Finance Analytics by Martin Nort. And I must admit that uh, most of the videos I watch with a lot of numbers and a lot of data, which is very important, has my little brain lost a lot of the times. And that's not knocking Martin, it's um, just my the way my brain is. So as far as the DFA channel, I have decided to concentrate on once a month DFA live scenarios and Q&A, and then additional video of additional property and finance Q&A video. I find a lot of value there. Having said that, I think that uh, this was the latest uh, scenario which we are going to come back to. It won't be an easy point to argue, especially given this. First tonight, back-to-back -back rate cuts and a lack of stock on the market have seen a strong surge in home prices in Sydney and Melbourne, signalling the end of that very short housing correction. While analysts are calling the bottom, they're also cautioning we may not be seeing the beginning of a fresh boom just yet. Nationally, capital city house prices rose close to 1% in August. That was really all down to Sydney and Melbourne, which rose 1.6 and 1.4% respectively. If we continue to see this kind of growth, we fully expect that there's going to be some new macro prudential policies brought in to try and uh, slow down that rate of growth. In all, five of the eight capital cities had price rises, but Darwin, Perth and Adelaide continued to fall. Okay, so why is this the case? Why have prices recovered in uh, August 2019? Because I am sure we'll be referring back to this video in about 12 months time, how it all looked like it was coming back. And they're even saying now that they're going to use measures to tackle this growth and they'll try and stifle it. And knowing that they were panicking just a month ago and, and two and three and six months ago, because it was tanking, as if they're going to now implement measures to slow the growth of the property. They can't wait for property to absolutely explode again, which it isn't going to. So again, why? Why did this happen? But first, let's see what actually happened in August. So August 2019, we got the month. This is what we're looking at. So Sydney's gone up 1.6%. Uh, Melbourne, 1.4%. Uh, Brisbane, 0.2%, it really doesn't know where to go. Uh, very important, Sydney and Melbourne. That will be the key to this why, in my opinion. Uh, and nobody's looking at this, uh, by the way, the way I'm looking at it. And I'm just following Martin Armstrong's lead where 
uh, nothing happens in isolation. They're going to try and explain this by local factors, not looking at the whole picture, the world. I think I've given away uh, a little bit of what's coming up. So again, no surprise, Adelaide minus 0.2%, Perth uh, minus 0.5, and not a surprise there, that it's been declining for a long time. Hobart up 0.5%, Again, no surprise because it's still relatively cheap uh, compared to the rest. Darwin, another kind of write-off, minus 1.2%. Uh, Canberra, government, they're still taxing uh, the hell out of us, 0.8% uh, up. So combined capitals, it's gone up in one month, 1%. Combined regional, uh, minus uh, 0 0.1%. And national is uh, 08 up. That's where we're at, at the 3rd of September 2019, which is when I'm creating this video. Of course, so back to uh, why. Uh, this uh, news.com.au article says the national property market has recorded its largest monthly increase in more than two years as Australians capitalize on low interest rates, tax cuts, and a slight loosening in lending standards. See, that's localized. And that's kind of true and plausible. So it'll make you believe that that's what's happening. Now, if that's the case, why haven't they all gone up? Why, hasn't Sydney, why has Sydney gone up so much more and Melbourne so much more than the rest of the country? I mean, after all, combined regional ha are still dropping. It is a speculation, fear of missing out and desperate money. What's the desperate money? Desperate money coming from not so much China, but we've got the new contender, a new competitor, Hong Kong. Have you seen the latest news, uh, how the Hong Kong is slowly slipping into the complete chaos with uh, you know, Chinese police and the army um, just about to enter and take over? Because any f fundamental analysis of the property would tell you that you wouldn't want to be buying these things. Like, there's an example. Here's an article that says that a, a rundown property at Roselle in Sydney has sold for $2.01 million. Uh, this is the property, ladies and gentlemen. Collapsing hovels selling for up to $2 million at Sydney auction market turn red hot again. Here is what $2 million buys you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in August 2019, this is it. You can have it for a cool two million Australian dollars. Had numerous structural issues. Look at that. 179 Denison Street, Newtown sold for 1.1 million dollars. Look at that. That's mold. That's just falling apart. Uh, absolutely. Uh, to me, it looked like a kitchen. At but obviously it's a bathroom because you've got a bathtub there and uh, I think it's an integrated laundry. But hey, uh, there's plenty of potential for the renovator. Renovator's dream. Something a little bit more affordable. 17 Burke Street, North Parramatta sold for $785,000. This is not too bad. This looks pretty good. It's got a nice facade. Oh, wait, that is the same place. It's completely gutted. The North Parramatta house was burnt in a kitchen fire. But there's more. 72 Albert Street Leichhardt for sale and expectation is around a million dollars. There is more lovely real estate in Sydney you can buy. That's one of them. That's yet another. The Cleveland Street in Redfern is expected to attract renovators. Told you. Renovators delight. As far as who is buying this garbage and that desperate money I was talking about, I really don't want to repeat myself and I want to refer you to, let's say, as a bit of a homework, uh, two videos. Um, in a shameless self promotion or promoting plug, I'm going to refer you to one of my videos, a money laundering. Property to drop as Australia no longer a place of choice for Chinese money laundering. Now, there is a blow off top currently uh, going on and not just from mainland China, but Hong Kong because of the geopolitics. I will include the link below as well as the, the other video that 
I can't go into geopolitics as much as these people can. It's Real Vision Finance. It was um, posted about a week ago and it's already had uh, one point, over 1 1.3 million views. It is an eye-opener. Uh, this uh, was behind the paywall uh, and they've just made it public, like I said, a, a week ago and it's seen so many views. It is an eye-opener. Steve Bannon pulls no punches on China. It's just mind-boggling. I really recommend it. I think I mentioned it already. I'll include the link in the description also. You will see why this is the last final desperate attempt for the money, a lot of the times dirty money, coming across from China and Hong Kong to get out of there before it's all confiscated and before we have the beginning of the Third World War. But that is another topic, another video I have been thinking about to create. That's kind of bad news, Third World War, never good. The good news is, however, and this is very conspiratorial, is that nuclear weapons, as they tell us, don't really exist. I know, economy times, you've gone mad. Trust me, this is good news. Okay, and my next point I'm going to argue uh, is not always easy, especially when the news and headline is that the Sydney home prices have gone up by 1.6% and Melbourne 1.4% in August alone. So Martin North's scenarios, uh, what I agree with uh, more or less is that um, the current most likely scenario of 35% is the Armageddon Island 2.0, as he calls it. Um, previously, last month, uh, which is July 2019, was 25%. So this scenario has risen. Uh, let's say that's possibly true. What I don't agree with is that uh, if we had RBA rate uh, drop the interest rates because they're panicking so much, down to zero or maybe just a quarter of a percent. We got unemployment rate up to 10%, right? We got mortgage stress up to 45% and bank losses are 12 plus basis points. Why do you think that the home prices will drop? This is supposed to be minus 30 to 45%. I'm sorry, but home prices will drop 80%. There's nothing to hold it. There will be no bid. Apart from that desperate money that's pouring into Sydney and Melbourne only, the rest of the country and overall the Sydney, oh, sorry, Australian market, in my opinion, is going to drop at least 60 to 80 percent. So this uh, 30 to 45 percent, when it's really blowing up everywhere, is a little bit optimistic, and there's no reason to be nice and polite and cautious when we are predicting. So if this is actually the scenario it's going to be much more than 45% drop. Once again, not financial advice, but please don't compete with this dirty money entering the country and also very desperate money at the moment. Just stay on the sidelines. If it continues to go up, if it doubles, uh, you're still safe to stay out because it's insane. Uh, looking at what we make, uh, what I made 10 years ago, what I make now, is pretty much the same. Everything's just going double at least. Fundamentally, it absolutely does make sense to get in at these levels anyway. Australia has got a $9 billion a year drug problem. Organised crime gangs have a flood of money to launder and real estate is a favoured vehicle. Despite the size of the problem, Australia is under fire for lax laws, which fail to force lawyers, real estate agents and accountants to inform authorities about suspicious transactions. It comes as watchdog... One of the problems is that real estate agents, accountants and lawyers don't have to report suspicious activity, unlike in other countries, including New Zealand. Ostrak estimates that around $1 billion in suspicious money from China alone was invested in Australian real estate in 2015-16.